The Sexy Lamp Test, coined by Kelly Sudaconic in 2013, is a literary analysis test wherein you replace a female character with a sexy lamp and see if the story still works. If it does, that's not a great female character. Needless to say, if the main character of your first-person POV trilogy can be replaced with a sexy sun lamp being carted from location to location, it's not a good look. And listen, I love Leigh Bardugo, but I think even she would admit that the Shadow and Bone books aren't the best representative sample of her work. Whose first work is? And that's why today I want to look at the agency of Alina Starkov in the books versus in the Netflix adaptation. What can I say about book Alina? She's boring. <laughs> Like, there's more to say, but it boils down to she's just really boring. Her motivations are shallow, she doesn't have much personality, her interactions with other characters are consequently bland, and she gets dragged through the plot like a sled tied to a toddler on a snow day. She's not particularly likable, or at least in my opinion, relatable, and that makes her, from a writing perspective, a bad POV character. The fact that she barely is a character also contributes to this massive flaw in the writing of these books. And again, this isn't to hate on Leigh Bardugo at all. The fact that I'm even making this video is a testament to the fact that she herself recognized what needed to change about Alina to make her a compelling protagonist, because those changes got made in the show that Lee had a hand in creating. But before we get to those changes, we have to talk about the source material. And however much I love Miss Bardugo and her later works, I'm less of a fan of this particular source material. The Grisha trilogy is written from a first person point of view, which is not inherently bad, but it has to be done right. For an example of really, really well done first person POV, let's look at the Percy Jackson and the Olympians series. PJO is written from Percy's point of view, and it's constantly showing how screamingly unprepared he is for life as a demigod, and later, as a chosen one. Part of what makes this work so well is Percy's personality, which comes through in every moment of the narration. He's sarcastic, snarky, and just a genuinely fun character who keeps up a running commentary of what's going on that matches his traits in a way that not all first-person stories manage to do. Granted, Rick Riordan is the god of first-person POV, and Lee Bardugo does better with a third-person limited, so this isn't necessarily a fair comparison, but it does highlight the inadequacies of the Grisha trilogy. The fact that I can barely come up with any traits to describe Alina is troublesome, to say the least. She's not really snarky, except when she is. She doesn't have a notable sense of humor, and the narration doesn't even really feel like she's the one telling it because it lacks a distinct voice from her lack of characterization. Basically, the books could have been written from a third-person limited perspective and it wouldn't really change much, but it would at least make Alina's non-characterness stand out less. And to go back a sentence, the characterization she does have feels… inconsistent. Sometimes she's a meek young girl scared to make waves, and sometimes she's a snappy YA protagonist with the customary witty comebacks. While this dichotomy might work and make sense in some characters who find themselves an outsider in an unfamiliar situation, the two halves of Alina's personality never quite seem to mesh into one cohesive character. The difference isn't between when she's in her element or out of her depth, but rather when the narrative needs her to be sharp or timid which leaves her feeling less like a character and more like a plot device. She's also rather whiny about her whole experience as the Sun Summoner, and while that's a common enough trait in Chosen One protagonists, especially of the YA variety, I can't say it's one I enjoy, especially when it becomes the most memorable trait a character has. I'm not kidding when I say that in rereading these books for this video, my third read-through, by the way, I was blindsided by Alina's snappy comments in the beginning because that's a quality that just doesn't stick in my mind. Part of it may be that other characters are more interesting than Alina <coughs> Nikolai <coughs> and draw focus in my memory, but somehow in spite of the quips, Alina remains cardboard bland in my memory. 
And I think that's because the narration doesn't actually have any of that quippiness, at least not in the same way Percy Jackson does that's so standout. Alina's narrative voice is so gloomy and detached in places that it's hard to imagine it represents the same character who's speaking half the time. Before we talk about the differences between the books and the show, I think it's important to define what characteristics make a character interesting. That way we can see where the writing of the books falls short and the writing of the show picks up the slack. Most often characters are seen by audiences as interesting when they have depth and complexity. Now that's a pretty broad and nebulous definition, so let's break it down into a few categories. 1. Motivations for a character to feel like they have a stake in the plot, the author has to make their motivations clear. Without clear motivations, it's more difficult to pinpoint why a character is invested in the plot, which can leave them feeling irrelevant to it. If we go back to the concept of the medicine journey, imagine how much less we would care about the protagonist's quest without the first steps that establish the status quo and the threat to it, the reason for embarking on the journey in the first place. If we never learn why it's so important that they find and return with their elixir, their success becomes much less of a priority for us. Additionally, a character's motivation is one of the things that helps the audience get invested in the character themselves. Characters who seemingly have no stake in the plot feel bland and uninteresting because nothing that happens really affects them in any meaningful way. Without a goal to work towards, how can a character ever know the epic highs and lows of high school football? I mean, the three-act structure. Setbacks and successes are integral parts of storytelling, and they work because of how the characters react to them. If the character isn't invested enough in the plot, they won't have interesting reactions to it, which makes them boring to watch. This problem is also evident when the characters have shallow motivations that either leave them on the outskirts of everything that happens or makes the audience wonder why they do care so much at all. Any character who feels detached from the plot in some way is going to be a worse character than one who has well-defined motivations behind their participation. 2. Personality you might think it goes without saying that a character needs to have a personality to be interesting, but I have come across some flat personality list protagonists in my time, which means somehow people are getting published without apparently being told that. A character's personality comes through in their thoughts, behaviors, and speech. Often, all of these are covered in narrative voice when the story is written from a first-person or third-person limited point of view, though in third-person omniscient, it usually comes from character interactions. Just like real people, characters can have all sorts of personality traits and flaws, and the unique combinations of the two make them feel like dynamic characters that people want to know more about. It's important, however, that their personality traits aren't so conflicting that they don't feel like one cohesive character. Sometimes authors will try to cram every YA protagonist personality trait that's been popular in the past decade into one character, which usually leads to them feeling like a complete mess of stale tropes with counterintuitively no defining personality. And personality is usually what leads to the blorboification of characters, what makes them likable or loathable to the point of becoming instant fan favorites. There are often trends in what types of personalities are popular. Just look at Tumblr's recent fascination with pathetic wet cat men for an example of that. But whether or not a character follows that trend, their personality is usually what draws people to them. Lovable asshole is another favorite, as is nominal villain with a heart of gold. Think Dr. Doofenshmirtz or Megamind. These combinations of traits create fun characters who have interesting and fun dynamics with other characters. And speaking of, three, how they interact with other characters. Storytelling these days has moved away from strictly plot-driven storytelling and towards character-driven storytelling. That's not to say that the plot doesn't matter, but rather that characters' actions move the plot forward rather than the plot moving the characters. As a consequence of this shift, more focus is now given to character dynamics and interactions. The newfound prominence of the found family trope is a great example of this. While in the past, protagonists may have been working together towards a common goal and probably ended up as friends along the way due to working together, 
Now, characters come together for personal reasons and end up engaged in shenanigans while their bonds of friendship grow ever stronger, and they all become so close that shippers are really only left with the option to say, Polycrows is canonically supported, here are 15 reasons why, and write endless fics about the fun and fascinating dynamics between the be-gay, do-crime, polyamorous found family of the century. <clears throat> What I mean is, found family has become a juggernaut of a trope that especially appeals to queer people due to the emphasis on non-traditional connections with other people, and this is in large part due to the ways storytelling has changed to feature relationship dynamics as more central to the plot. When characters interact with each other, that gives us a feel for the personalities of each character while also giving us fun or interesting dynamics to get invested in. But this only works if they interact in fun or interesting ways. If a hero and villain only interact with each other in the most straightforward, boring way imaginable, no one's going to be invested in that hero-villain dynamic. But if they have banter or weird sexual tension that makes you wonder if the bad guy is really all that bad, or if the good guy is really all that good, people are going to be drawn in and want to see more of them interacting. Similarly, no one is going to yell about found family on the internet if none of your five-man band really seem to like each other and all their conversations feel like clinical vessels to move the plot forward. And like I said, group dynamics reflect back on individual personalities and make the individual parts of the group more interesting by extension. 4. Internal Conflict a lot of these categories tend to bleed into each other in some way or another, and internal conflict goes hand in hand with both personality and motivation. When a character has conflicting motivations, like a goal to save the world versus their desire to be with their love interest, for example, it adds depth to their character by creating opportunities to either help or hinder one or both goals. Do they choose to save the world and by doing so push their love interest away, or do they choose their love interest and damn the world? Usually, of course, they find a way to do both, and the way they solve that problem is where the intrigue comes from. Sometimes internal conflict is less majorly plot-altering, like a character's struggle with coming to terms with their feelings. When these conflicts are well-written, they can feel just as tense and important as the rest of the plot, especially when shipping is involved. When they're less well-written, it can feel like the story is putting far too much emphasis on something minor and like the plot is stalling out. When the former kind of internal conflict is poorly written, it can feel like the hero's too angsty to really be a hero, or worse, like they're too stupid for either not making the obvious decision to save the world or not seeing the obvious solution to both problems. However, good internal conflict helps flesh out characters. Conflicting motivations or struggles with inner demons are situations that real people experience, and giving your characters these traits makes them more likely to be seen as dynamic and interesting. Without internal conflict, characters often feel flat and like they're only there to move the plot along, not like they're unique characters with complex inner worlds. This is a particularly bad problem in character-driven storytelling, where more time is spent exploring the inner world of characters. 5. Agency Agency is something I plan to talk about in more depth later in this video, but it's something that's vitally important to characters feeling like they actually impact the story instead of simply being impacted by it. A character who just gets pulled through the plot isn't interesting. They feel more like an object than a character, and that's where the sexy lamp test comes from. Too often, characters simply have things happen to them and are pushed from place to place like a log caught in an ocean current rather than making choices that move the plot forward. This is especially noticeable in modern stories, which are nominally character-driven, but in reality come across as just the opposite due to the main character or characters not making any many plot-relevant choices. In my opinion, first-person writing should always lead to character-driven storytelling, and when it doesn't, it's distracting. It's my belief that characters who have agency in their story will always be more interesting to read about or watch than characters who just go where they're told to by other characters. Now with all that out of the way, let's talk about Alina Starkov in the show. How does show Alina differ from book Alina? Well, for one thing, she's played by Jessie Mae Lee, my beloved. 
That might sound inconsequential, but Jessie is charming and charismatic and likable in a way that bleeds into her performance and imbues Alina with those qualities. Qualities she noticeably doesn't have in the books. Additionally, show Alina is genuinely funny, with a lot of memorable lines that still make me giggle. Her character feels much more consistent, and she's lost a lot of the whininess that made book Alina so unbearable. Rather than complaining constantly about the situations she finds herself in and having a consistently doom and gloom outlook on things, Sho Alina finds ways to turn situations around and takes control of her life as much as she can. Being a more fleshed out character not only makes Alina a more interesting protagonist, it also makes her interactions with other characters more interesting. In the books, all her relationships are rather one note and often more defined by the other character than by Alina. Her relationship with Mal is questionable because she likes him despite his constant mistreatment of her, a topic for its own video, and every twist in the will-they-won't-they they drama between them comes from either outside interference, aka the Darkling yoinking their letters, or from Mal's own shittiness as a character, which is, again, a tangent for another video. Her relationship with Jenya is mostly defined by Jenya's actions, the ups and downs being determined exclusively by how Alina reacts to those actions and not by Alina's own actions. Her rivalry with Zoya, while tinged with her own jealousy, is mostly spurred on by Zoya's jealousy and provocation. Her relationship with the Darkling is entirely the product of his manipulation tactics. And so on. In the show, however, Alina's relationships all feel more dynamic because they're no longer one character playing off a cardboard cutout. Alina actively fights back against Zoya's bullying, making their rivalry feel significantly less one-sided. Her friendship with Jenya has more depth due to them sharing deeper conversations than just idle gossip. With Mal, a big reason their relationship feels better is because he actually cares about her, but she's also more open with him about her mistakes and what she wants. And while her romance with the Darkling is still very much due to manipulation, Alina does make more choices to actively pursue the relationship than she does in the book. She's also given more of a chance to be a mirror to the Darkling towards the end of season 2 when we start getting hints of Dark Alina, but that's more of the canon divergence aspect of the show than just the fixing the bad writing aspect. Although it has to be said that her dynamic with Alexander is more interesting because of where they're taking her character. Aside from characterization, a big thing missing from Alina in the books is the concept of agency. Agency is defined as the capacity, condition, or state of acting or of exerting power. In this context, it boils down to the capacity of a character to act in a way that compels the plot forward. Although, since it's often talked about when it's lacking, it usually gets defined in opposition to the concept of a character getting pulled through the plot without any input from their actions. Lack of agency is hardly a new problem, especially in YA media, and especially when the protagonist is some kind of chosen one. Often, there's not a whole lot chosen ones can do to change the trajectory of their chosen oneness, and if that's where the writer stops, the story can suffer because it doesn't feel like the character is actually, well, relevant to the story. So usually writers will have moments outside of the specific Chosen One Destiny arc where the character is allowed to the agency to make choices that affect the narrative. Whether that's a Darkest Hour refusal of the call or Katniss Everdeen shooting President Coin instead of President Snow, these choices often change the trajectory of the story on the scale of an episode or two while the deuteragonists try to get the hero back or forever as Katniss spares the life of one dictator to prevent another from taking his place and the world has to come to terms with that choice. Alina has very little agency in the books. Almost all of the major plot-changing decisions are made by other characters, and Alina either goes along with them or has no say in the matter whatsoever. This gives her little room to do much more than react to other people's choices rather than make any real choices of her own, especially when choices that should be hers to make are inexplicably made for her by other characters. So let's take a look at some examples of the show giving Alina some of the agency she was tragically lacking in the books by changing critical moments of the plot. First, going into the fold. In the book, crossing the fold is part of Alina's cartography training, something she is required and expects to do. 
The only reason she is in the fold to be discovered as the Sun Summoner is because she was told to go somewhere, and she went there, the plot holding her hand through it all. In the show, however, going into the fold is a choice Alina makes with intention. Because Mal is sent into the fold, Alina deliberately burns all the maps of West Ravka, so she'll also be sent in to help replace them. And even then, rather than relying on her superiors to send her somewhere, Alina volunteers to make the journey, making her proactive instead of just reactive. With this change, the inciting incident isn't just something that unavoidably happens to the protagonist, but is something that she is partially responsible for, having gone into the fold by choice rather than on someone's orders. Second, escaping the little palace. In the book, escaping the little palace, with the goal of going to Novia Zem, is Bagra's idea that Alina goes along with. It comes after perhaps the least self-aware line in the books. I wasn't going to make it easy for him anymore. All right, I said, reaching for the pile of clothes Bagra had brought me. What do I do? Where Alina says she's going to take action and immediately asks someone else for instructions to follow. This only serves to highlight how dependent the plot is on literally every other character except Alina. Whereas in the show, when Bagra tells Alina to go right at the fork in the secret passage so they can regroup and come up with a plan, Alina makes the decision to go left, stow away in a cart, and leave the little palace altogether. This not only puts the trajectory of the plot into Alina's hands, but also leaves a lingering what if with the audience as we wonder what Bagra's original plan was and how the story might have been different if Alina hadn't made the choice she did. Third, going after the stag. In the book, Mal is the one who decides they should go after the stag to try to get it before the Darkling. In the show, Alina makes this critical decision, which makes more sense considering it's a choice that affects her personally and in an extremely significant way. Having Mal make this decision for her is a weird writing choice in my opinion, and I'm really glad they changed it for the show, because in the book it sends the message that Alina has very little say in anything that happens to her or in life-altering matters that primarily affect her alone. Fourth, Chasing the Sea Whip In Siege and Storm, the Darkling kidnaps Alina from her somewhat settled life in Novia Zem, having tracked the trade of her golden hairpins, and forces her and Mal to track down the Sea Whip to be her second amplifier. In Season 2 of the show, Alina makes it known from very early on that she's searching for the Sea Whip herself in Novia Zem. In fact, it's the whole reason she and Mal went to Novia Zem. Having Alina be the one to seek out not only the Firebird later, but the Sea Whip as well, allows her to take more control over her own power and the ways that alters her life going forward. It also makes for a good foundation for the canon divergence the show gets into later, which hints at Alina being seduced by power in dark and foreboding ways. If the books had tried to do Dark Alina, the slide from the side of good probably would have been due to the Darkling's manipulative actions rather than Alina's own struggle with the pull of power, making it a significantly less interesting plot than what the show is doing. These aren't arbitrary changes that were made just for the hell of it. They all serve to make Alina feel less like an object being moved from place to place by other characters and more like a character in her own right, with the ability to think and make choices that change the plot. The creative team behind the show made these changes with intention to make the story better, and I, for one, am so glad they did. To sum up, Alina Starkov is a book character with a lot of flaws that stem from mediocre writing, but a TV show character with considerably more characterization and agency. Leigh Bardugo and the Netflix writing team did an excellent job of fleshing her out and turning her into a character I genuinely enjoy watching, and Jessie Mae Lee did a wonderful job with what they gave them. There are so many other aspects of the show that I could talk about that demonstrate the same care and attention in the changes made and the things left as they are. I really think Lee personally looked at her earlier writing and noticed what things were important to change to make the story and characters more compelling. And I'm so glad she actually got a chance to make those changes. I could go on and on about the things I enjoy about this adaptation, but I'll leave off with this. 
In a pop culture space where more accurate adaptations and adaptations with the author's own involvement are becoming more common, I think Shadow and Bone is a very good example of what things to change and what things to keep verbatim. Is it perfect? No, of course not. There are still some writing flaws and their decision to speed run three entire books in season two was understandable in some respects and confusing in others. And the show certainly had its share of controversy in season one, which I do not feel qualified to talk about. But overall, I think it's a good adaptation that can appeal to old and new fans alike and makes some really good choices in adapting a mid-tier source material into something greatly enjoyable. And it makes for an excellent object lesson in giving characters the agency they need to feel like actual characters.